Welcome back to this third video in the plate tectonic series. Today we're going to be talking about plate boundary types. The learning targets for this video are to list and describe the evidence used to support the plate tectonics theory. We did a lot of that in the second video. If you didn't watch that one, you might want to go back and watch that first. To compare and contrast the different types of plate boundaries, to discuss the formation and breakup of Pangaea, to describe models explaining driving mechanisms for plate tectonics, and to categorize volcanism based on magma composition and location relative to plate boundaries. So we're going to start out with a discussion about divergent plate boundaries. If something diverges, it moves away, pointing away. And primarily when we're talking about dry, divergent plate boundaries, we're going to be talking about rifts and ridge systems. So the most common type of divergent plate boundary is one on the ocean floor, which is a mid-ocean ridge system, often called an MOR. And you can see a diagram of a mid-ocean ridge system's topography in the top right corner here. So at the center of the mid-ocean ridge, you have the rift valley, and that is the area where there is a magma chamber underneath being fed from partial melt coming from the asthenosphere. And that magma, because it is hot and it is less dense, it buoys up and it breaks through that ocean floor crust creating new ocean floor crust, which then spreads out in both directions, to the right and to the left in this picture. Now you can see that there are some hills to either side of that central rift valley floor, and there are faults along those hills. Because this is an extensional environment, there are normal faults there. There are also very shallow earthquakes along mid-ocean ridge systems. Beneath this picture, you can see a, a cross-section of the Atlantic Ocean topography. So on this left side, we have North America, and on the right side, we have Europe, and in the center, we have the Mid-Ocean Ridge, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge in this situation. And you'll notice that that Mid-Atlantic Ridge is actually an underwater range of volcanic mountains. As you move away to the west towards North America or to the east towards Europe, moving away from or with increasing distance from that mid-ocean ridge, the depth of the ocean increases. And here's why. The highest heat flow is at the rift itself. Moving away from the rift to the east or to the west in the case of the mid-Atlantic, that rock is cooling off and as it cools, it contracts. And as it contracts, the ocean floor sinks. So the ocean itself becomes deeper and deeper. So you have the highest heat flow over the ridge itself with decreasing heat flow with increasing distance from that mid-ocean ridge. Likewise, the temperature of the rock decreases with increasing distance from that mid-ocean ridge. And the age of the rock increases as you move away from that central rift valley. The age of the rock in either direction, away from a divergent plate boundary, increases as those plates are moving away from each other and new crust is being created. Those are some basic ideas about divergent plate boundaries. And be sure to remember that divergent plate boundaries can form either on an ocean floor or they can form on a continental location like what's happening in Africa where the continent of Africa is actually rifting apart. So we have a brand new divergent plate boundary there. And if that continues to happen, it may even separate enough so that we have a new ocean formed. Let's move on to uh, look at the extent of divergent plate boundaries globally. In this image, you'll notice that the divergent plate boundaries are shown by the blue arrows pointing away from one another. So starting on the right side of this diagram, in the Atlantic Ocean, a divergent plate boundary runs all the way down the center of the Atlantic Ocean. That's known as the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. In the Pacific Ocean, 
We have the East Pacific Rise running between the Pacific Plate and the Nazca Plate to the west of South America. And divergent plate boundaries, notice, run all the way south and then up into the Indian Ocean and all the way back over to the western coast of Africa. So that's the extent of divergent plate boundaries. We're going to turn our attention now to convergent plate boundaries, but before we do, we'd like you to notice that the convergent plate boundaries on this map are shown by the red arrows pointing toward one another. So you will notice that around the entire Pacific Ocean, we have what's known as the Ring of Fire. And those are all convergent plate boundaries, places where the plates are moving toward one another. Likewise, around Southeast Asia, we have considerable numbers of convergent plate boundaries. And you'll notice that there is a continent to continent convergent plate boundary where India is colliding with the Eurasian plate. So in the next slide, we'll look more closely at convergent plate boundaries when an oceanic and a continental plate collide with one another. The common topography and features there are a subduction zone. So in this diagram in the top right, we have the oceanic crust, which is dense, typically made of basalt, moving from left to right in this diagram. And it's colliding with this continental material on the right side, which because it's less dense, floats up on top of that oceanic crust. So the oceanic crust is actually subducted down into the earth. It is driven down into the asthenosphere at this location. As that happens, we have large amounts of water being driven down along with it that form from the accretionary wedge where uh, sediments containing water are dragged down. And because of that, they melt earlier than typical wet rock versus dry rock melting. And we'll look at that in a moment. And we have little blobs of melt, little blobs of magma that are now rising because their density is less than the surrounding rock. And that's when we start to see volcanic activity and intrusions forming along and parallel to that plate boundary. So the plate boundary itself is typically marked by this deep ocean trench, and that marks that subduction zone. Also associated with our large number of earthquakes, and as you might imagine, the earthquakes are happening in what's called the Benioff zone, which is along the top boundary of this subducting oceanic lithosphere. And those earthquakes get deeper as you go towards the interior of this continent. In the diagrams below, we are looking at the difference between wet rock and dry rock in terms of the melting point. So these diagrams are a little bit different maybe than you're used to looking at because the x-axis shows increasing temperature from left to right, but the y-axis shows increasing depth within the earth and thus increasing pressure from overlying rock going from low pressure and low depth at the top, increasing going downward. And that makes a lot of sense if you think about the geometry of a subduction zone where you're looking at the plate descending, we're also looking at the plate descending here. So what you can see is in the case of a dry rock, which is this diagram on the left, the solid point, the melting point, and then if you look at the diagram on the right, you'll notice that this blue line indicates for wet rock, rock that has water incorporated into the structure of the minerals, and that the temperature of melting is lower for the wet rock than it is for the dry rock. And that's why we see this volcanic activity associated with a subduction zone. Let's turn now and look at a different type of convergent plate boundary. There are many examples in the Pacific Ocean where two ocean plates are colliding with one another. And you can see in this top diagram that we still have the typical subducting plate, that would be the one that has the higher density, and the typical deep ocean trench, 
Just like in the situation where an ocean plate is colliding with a continental plate, we have volcanoes forming on the plate that floats up above at that subduction zone. So here we have a map that shows this volcanic island arc. Here we have Asia. Here we have Alaska. And you can very clearly see the outline of the subduction zone here, that deep ocean trench. And this is a line of volcanoes, a volcanic island arc that has formed on this oceanic crust. And those volcanic island arcs, just as the continental volcanics parallel the subduction zone, they do too. So the third type of convergent plate boundary is when two continental plates collide with one another. And the perfect example of this is India colliding with Eurasia. And at that collision point, we see a huge mountain range. We see the Himalayas. So as those two continental land masses are colliding, they are simply buckling up that material in between the two. And today, the Himalayas are still growing because India is still pushing to the north and east relative to Eurasia, which is pushing to the south and west. Other continental-continental collision zones are the Alps, the Appalachians, and the Urals. Our third type of plate boundary is a transform plate boundary. There are two main types of transform plate boundaries. The first is an oceanic fracture zone. So if you look at a map of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, you'll notice that it is offset along the length of that divergent plate boundary. So here in the middle picture, we can see all these segments of divergent plate boundaries offset by these east-west running transform faults. Those transform faults, or oceanic fracture zones, connect the segments of the divergent plate boundaries. And there is also earthquake activity along those oceanic fracture zones, although that earthquake activity tends to be very weak and shallow. A bigger concern are transform faults on land, such as the San Andreas Fault. So in this bottom picture, you can see the outline of one segment of, the trans, of this transform fault, the San Andreas Fault. You can look for offsets between features. So you can look for river valleys that are offset across from one side to another. You can look for mountains that are offset. And in this picture down here in the bottom right, you're seeing a cartoon that shows a river or a stream that's been offset in that transform plate boundary. One of the major differences between transform plate boundaries and divergent and convergent plate boundaries is that there is not volcanic activity there because those plate boundaries move side to side. There is no vertical component in a transform plate boundary. So we don't have any volcanic activity. We simply have a lot of earthquake activity. And finally, we can talk about Pangaea breaking up. So up here in the top diagram, we have the supercontinent of Pangaea about 200 to 250 million years ago, when all of the land masses were together. And you can follow through with the breakup of the supercontinent into the two major continents, Laurasia, which included uh, what is now North America and what is now Eurasia breaking away from Gondwana land, which was then South America, still connected up with Africa, Antarctica, and India at about 200 million years ago. By about 100 million years ago, we had the initial stage of the Atlantic Ocean opening. Notice that the North America and Europe section split first. South America and Africa did not split till later on, till maybe about 60 million years ago. And you'll notice the position of the subcontinent of India. At 100 million years ago, India was still very far south. And India has moved very rapidly up to the north to collide with Eurasia, where we see it today in that continent-continent collision. So I think you're uh, ready to review the learning targets here. We talked about evidence used to support the plate tectonics theory. We compared and contrasted the different types of plate boundaries. We looked at the breakup of Pangaea and models for plate movement, and we talked about volcanic activity at those plate boundaries. Ready for your mastery check quiz, and I'll see you in class.